morning, everybody. Hey, let me ask you this. How many of you enjoy reading a good book? How many of you enjoy reading so much when you go on vacation, you pack four or five books to take along with you? Or how many of you have that annoying person that goes along with you on vacation that packs four? <laughs> oh, did I say that? <laughs> I say that out loud. And how many of you haven't cracked open a book since it was required of you back in high school? Anybody? All right. So maybe when it comes to a good story for you, you get those from movies and television shows instead, right? But whatever it might look like for you, I would guess the majority of us really enjoy a good story, don't we? How many of you read this book? Anybody remember this book? I'm just curious as I go through some of these book titles and that. Just raise your hand if you know any of these. I remember in third grade, Mrs. DeChiro was my teacher, and I absolutely loved her, and I loved story time because we'd all get around her. She had a rocking chair and the carpet, and we'd all get on there for about a half hour, and she would read stories to us. And this was one of my absolute favorite stories. What about, anybody read uh, Jack London? He was the one that had Call the Wild, White Fang. Some of you guys remember that one. Uh, another one of my favorite was S.E. Hinton, The Outsiders. That was then, this is now. Any of you read those when you were younger? And then I was talking with Rachel. She had her favorites. I wanted to get, you know, the girl's side of stuff here. How many of you gals, Judy Bloom? you read that? Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Evidently, some of you guys did as well, so that's okay. <laughs> Ann Martin, Babysitter Club books. How many of you read those, right? As an adult, she likes Francine Rivers, Terry Blackstock, D. Henderson. Chapter after chapter, page after page of these gripping tales of adventure, tragedy, and triumph. You could hardly wait to see what was going to happen next. The author just had this way of taking you on a journey with them through it all. A great author has the ability to do that. The story they weave just hooks you, and you're just along for the ride. But do you know who my favorite author of all time as a kid was? Me. <laughs> how, how, how many of you remember getting one of these? Somewhere around, Kyle and I were talking about this, like around fourth grade, and your teacher handed you what? A blank book. You got to be the author. You're the one that got to come up with the story. It was going to be whatever you wanted it to be. You were the author. And the greatest stories ever written were written by me. I was the hero. I was the one who had all the dreams come true. I was the one who always won the race. I was the one who came up with the greatest inventions of all time. I was the one who was rich and famous. I was the one that everybody else wanted to be like. My stories were awesome. But then something happened. I grew up. And I later realized that the greatest stories were never meant to be written by us. They are written and they are meant to be written by God alone. Because your story was never meant to be a me, 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 me story. It was meant to be a look at how great and powerful and loving and awesome our God is story. And a lot of you, you look back on your stories and there's a lot of chapters in your stories that that we're embarrassed about, and that we wish we could erase or tear out, right? How many of you have at least one chapter like that? All right? All of us have that. All of us have that baggage. All of us have those chapters from our lives that we would love to just remove or take back or get a do-over in. And the bad news is you can't travel back in time and start over. But the good news is, is that you can start in a new direction that can change what your story will look like for the future. And you do that by letting God be the author of your story. And when you do that, you will live a story that is worth telling. The reality is our stories are the sum total of the choices that we've made in our lives. Our story today is a direct result of the choices that we've made in the past and in part due to the choices that others that are close to us have made that directly impacted us. 
But just because you might have some chapters in your story that are unfair or embarrassing or heartbreaking, that doesn't mean that God can't redeem your story. Our stories are never so bad or so extreme that our awesome God can't make something beautiful out of them. If we just step aside and we let him become the author, which was the original design and the plan when he created you. So let's start off with this question today. How do we live a story that is worth telling? How do we live a story that is worth telling? How do we produce a story that we want to tell? And I think part of the answer we find in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, which is going to be our key verse for this series. And this is what we read there. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Fix our eyes on Jesus, the what? Author and perfecter of faith. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, we become fully aware that you and I were never intended to be the authors of our own lives. God's purpose and plans for our lives is so much better than anything that you and I could possibly write. And we, when we turn the pen or the pencil or the typewriter or the keyboard over to him, our life starts to make much more sense. And the stories just start getting better and better. So here's what we're going to do these next four Sundays. We're going, to, we're going to make four decisions, and each decision is going to be summarized in a single word. But if you make these four decisions, if you pay attention to these four words that we will focus on in this series, if you apply them to your life and you let God stir inside of you to see what you should be doing with them, I promise God will honor that intentionality on your part and he will start to move in your life in fresh new ways and he will start to author the next chapter of your life in a way that you never would have expected and it is far better than anything that you would have come up with on your own. And got the idea for this series from a book that us guys read in Fight Club this last chapter from Craig Rochelle called Divine Direction. Today's single word is start. Start. And I want to talk to you about deciding to start a habit or a discipline that can be life transforming. Because the reality is there are certain habits, there are certain disciplines that when you practice those habits and disciplines, they have this way of spilling forward into positive momentum and other positive habits. However, in the same way, the absence of those very key and specific habits and disciplines can cause your undisciplined lifestyle to unravel and spiral out of control as well. Let me give you an example. About 10 years ago, I took up running. Now, running is good for you in and of itself, but I found that it also has this tendency to create positive momentum in my life. Because when I ran, I was in better shape. And when I was in better shape, I watched my calorie intake better. And when I watched my calorie intake better, I lost weight. And when I lost weight, I overall had much more energy. And when I had much more energy, I accomplished more during the day. And when I accomplished more during the day at work, then it carried over to home, where I became a cleaning machine and fixed everything in sight. And when I did that, I was up for the greatest husband of all time award and had the admiration of all men everywhere. And, all right. My... I had a, the, the women are cheering there. The, the cleaning, yes. All right, Mike got a little carried away there, all right? Slight exaggeration towards the end there. But do you see my point how starting one positive habit or discipline can create momentum that carries over into other areas of your life? And the opposite is true as well. When I don't run, I don't care as much about my body. And when I don't care as much about my body, I don't pay much attention to what I'm shoveling down my throat. And when that happens, I drive down to the Dollar General store down the street from our house where I walk through the junk food aisles. And I say, do I want this or this or this? And my answer is yes. <laughs> right? And when I say yes in the store, the scale at home screams no. And when I see that number creeping up, it makes me depressed and stressed. So I do what many of us do when we get stressed. I head into the kitchen to the snack cabinet to make myself feel better. 
all because I didn't go for a run. You see how a positive habit can spill over in good ways? But the lack of having that habit or discipline can cause your life to spiral out of control. Sometimes when we don't have a healthy habit or discipline in our lives, our lives can unravel in very bad ways and lead to some bad chapters in our stories. And today we want to focus on starting a habit or a discipline that can transform our lives in a positive way. And each week we're going to look at a different Bible story where we see people making decisions that change the direction of their lives. Today we're going to look at a guy named Daniel. And there's actually a book in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is that part of the Bible which covers the history of God and his people before Jesus came to earth. And it, the name of that book is Daniel. And let me give you a quick background on the book of Daniel and, and where it falls in history, just so you can kind of be tracking with me when we get to the story. So in many ways, the storyline of the Old Testament, it kind of runs parallel to what's going on in our own country in modern times. We have political polarization, we have resistance to God, departing from values, increasing immorality, lack of spiritual leadership. And God had called his people to, a dip, to be different from the world, and he created this nation of Israel. And even though the people should have seen God as the king over them, they wanted to be like the other countries around them, and they asked for a human king. So God gave them this request, and it was the beginning of all kinds of trouble for Israel. And eventually, the people split into two nations, Israel and Judah. And then we have this historical record of these 39 kings who led these two nations over the next 200 plus years. And we see this repeating pattern of how they continually turn away from God and do their own thing. And then finally, after being patient for hundreds of years and sending prophet after prophet to warn the people of what would happen if they continued in their ways, God took action against the people of Israel and Judah. And the first action was taken against Israel when God used the pagan country of Assyria to capture the Israelites and take them into captivity into various cities back in their home country. And years later, the same thing would happen to the people of Judah. Only this time, God used the pagan country of Babylon to bring judgment against his people. And when all was said and done, the people of Israel and Judah, they looked and saw that their cities had been leveled, their homes had been decimated, their temple had been destroyed, and their hope had been lost. Or at least they thought it was at the time. So the people had become exiles in a foreign land. And an exile is somebody who is forced to live where they do not belong. So in the book of Daniel, we read about Daniel and the challenges that he faced living in a foreign land that did not worship the God that he loved. He was constantly having to be intentional about how he lived his life because it was so much easier to just go with the flow than it was to fight against it. So Daniel ends up gaining the favor of the ruler at that time, this guy named King Darius, and King Darius had selected 120 governors to rule the territory, and he picked three men to be over those 120 governors, and Daniel was one of those three. And Daniel so stood out and in his integrity and in his leadership skills that the king said, I want to put Daniel in charge over everybody. And these other 20 guys were jealous, and they said, we've got to put a stop to the teacher's pet here, guys. We've got to figure something out. And that's where we pick up the story in Daniel chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. So the administrators and satraps, which are, that's their name for governors, tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but what? They were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. And finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So they came up with a plan. And they basically, they go to the king and they say, hey, king, we got this great idea. Wouldn't it be awesome if for the next 30 days, no one's allowed to pray to anybody or any god except to you? Because kings were thought of as being gods back then. And if they pray to any other god, throw them in the lion's den. And the king said, that sounds pretty cool to me. Let's make a law. No one prays to anybody but me. And if they do, they get thrown into the lion's den. And long story short, they found Daniel praying to the one true God. They made the king stick to his word by having him tossed into the lion's den. But God shows up and saves him anyways. And why was Daniel 
looked upon favorably? Why was he a man of integrity? Why was there no corruption found in him? Why did the king promote him in his leadership? Why did God show favor upon Daniel in the lion's den and deliver him from the mouth of the hungry lions? I'll tell you why. Because years before, Daniel made a decision to start doing something that made him into the man of integrity that he became. Let me show you what his decision was. Look at verse 10. When Daniel learned that the decree had been published, that's the decree that if you pray to anybody else, you get thrown in the lion's den. When he hears this, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God. What's the next words? Just as he had done before. Think about this. Who knows for how long he had done this? Certainly weeks, more likely months, perhaps years maybe more than a decade, three times a day, Daniel stopped whatever he was doing and he made an appointment with the one true king and God. He knelt before God and he aligned his heart to God. He worshiped his God and he prayed that God's will would be done in his life. Why was he successful? Why was he a man of integrity? Why was he looked upon favorably by the king? Why did he rise in influence? Because he made a decision to start three times a day praying to his God, and God transformed his story into the story that God wanted Daniel to tell. The decisions that we make today Determine the stories that we will tell tomorrow. So I want to pose two questions to you. The first is very simple. I want you to ask yourself this question. What does God want you to want? Say that with me. What does God want you to want? What does he want you to want? Another way to phrase it would be, what is the story that God wants you to tell five years from now in your life? What story does God want you to tell? What does God want you to want in the future? And let's face it, if we're being honest, all of us have areas of, in our lives that we know darn well aren't in line with what God wants for us. We all have those areas where we set ourselves up as the author, and we choose our way over God's way. And maybe it's time for that chapter to come to a close and time for a new chapter to begin with a new author putting the story to paper. Maybe for some of you, it might be time for a new financial chapter to start. You've been authoring your financial story for far too long, and you've got caught up in the materialism of our culture, and as a result, you've put yourself in a horrible situation financially. Maybe that's where you are, but it's not where you have to end up. What financial story does God want you to be able to tell in five years? And if you start the habit, if you start the discipline of getting a hold of your finances today, then five years from now, your story may be all about how you went from barely surviving paycheck to paycheck to a story of being out of debt and giving more generously than you have ever done in your lifetime. The decisions you make today determine the story that you will tell tomorrow. Maybe for some of you that are married or have kids, you're in the midst of another crummy chapter in life. Maybe in writing your own story, you've allowed your career or busyness to get in the way of you being the spouse or the parent that God has called you to be. It's time to start a new habit. It's time to start a new discipline that is God-honoring and begins a new chapter with God's plan for your marriage and your children at the very center of it all. Your story can be totally different in the future. Let God become the author, and a year or five from now, you're telling a totally different story to others, a story where your marriage is strong and deeply connected, and where you have made time for your children a priority. That could become your story if you decide today to start some different habits and disciplines, because the choices we make today determine the stories that we will tell tomorrow. 
Maybe your story needs to change when it comes to how you take care of yourself physically. Maybe it needs to change where it comes to you as an employer or an employee. Maybe your story needs to change in how you view yourself because you put way too much emphasis on getting your identity from how others see you and not nearly enough emphasis on finding your identity and how God sees you. Whatever that area is in your life that isn't matching up with God's bigger vision for your life, it's not too late to start a new chapter with him as the author. Take time today and this week to reflect on this first question. What does God want me to want? And then after you've taken time to identify that area, then you need to focus in on the application question. Because based on what God wants you to want, based on the story that you know God wants you to tell in the future, what do you need to start? What do you need to start in order to tell the story God wants to tell through you? What do you need to start to live a story worthy of telling? Just pick one thing to get started. How many of you are bad about, like I am, like New Year's resolution or whatever it is, when you decide, like, okay, it's time, to, it's time to get going, and then you, like, make ten promises instead of just focusing on one? Anybody else do that? Seriously, get some hands up because I'm going to feel really stupid if I'm the only one with a hand up in this entire place, right? I mean, I've done that. I'm like, all right, this is it. Today's the day. Here we go. From here on out. Reading Bible every day, exercising three times a week, only eating vegetables, giving away 20% of what I have and what I make, date night every week with the wife or the husband, fun outings with the kids every week, attend church at every function they put on the calendar all year long. We go nuts and we overcommit. We try to get started and move to that next level in way too many areas. Pick one and commit to that one. You pray and you ask God, what do you want me to want, God? What story do you want to tell with my life? And then figure out what that one discipline is that you need to start today to tell that story in the future. If you were here for the last series, we had our 25th uh, celebration series, we talked about how God stirs. And you have to pay attention and you have to be obedient to that. That God will stir in our lives, but we have a responsibility to seek that out, to follow up with that, to talk with people, to pray about that, to get in conversations and figure out, all right, I I feel like God might be stirring here and I need some wisdom, I need some insight from people I trust that love God and love me. You got to be obedient to that, and it takes time. It doesn't just happen. It's something you've got to commit to taking some time with. Same thing with the two questions I gave you today. What does God want me to want? I'm guessing you're not going to sit here in two seconds, boom, answer, done, I can leave now. In fact, I think maybe some people did get up and leave. I'm not sure. But no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) But you know what I'm saying? Like, you have to put the time into this. This isn't just some easy answer of, Chris, just tell us the answer for my life, right? You've got to do the work. You've got to be the one who's seeking after God and saying, God, what is it that you want me specifically to want? What does God want you to start? What do you think that might be? When you think about your life, when you think about where you're at in your relationship with Jesus Christ, What might God want you to start? And in light of what he wants you to want, what does he want you to start right now? Some of you you might have an insecurity. It might be an overeating problem. It might be an addiction. It might be an inappropriate quest for material things. It might be a bad thought process that you're using in your head about who you are. It might be unforgiveness. Maybe you need to start counseling. You need to submit yourself to somebody else who has the wisdom to say, here's the lies that you're believing. Here's what the Bible says about it so that you can renew your mind with truth because otherwise you're just continuing to build your life on lies. Some of you, you might be married and your marriage isn't what it could be or what it should be. And you know it 
like you've just been floating along for a long time now. And you may need to start doing something about that, doing something that helps your marriage. Maybe that's the one thing God's going to point out to you. You might decide to start praying together regularly. That's amazing what that can do for your marriage. Because you can't be real mad for very long if you're going to pray together regularly. you got to work things out. It's real hard to hold unforgiveness in your heart when you know you have to pray with your spouse. And so you may create this discipline of praying together, and that might do wonders for your marriage. Maybe it's reading the Bible, reading a book. Maybe you've been, maybe this is something you need to do with your spouse too if you're married. Maybe you haven't been alone with your spouse since you've had kids since 2003, and it's time to create some time. So you're going to start a date night on a regular basis. Some of you, when you look at your spiritual life, it's flat right now, and it shouldn't be. Maybe you need to start making church a real priority in your life. Not just going whenever it's convenient and just doing the things that are the most exciting for you, but really getting involved, using your gifts to make a difference in it, contributing financially, being a prayer warrior for it, engaging in the community of it. You may start making church a real priority and find out that being part of a life group becomes something significant where you have others who speak into your life and you get to know them at a deeper level and you can bury your soul to them and you can ask them for prayer and you know they will have your back. Maybe that's the thing you need to do is start being a part of a life group. Or maybe you need to start making God's word a real priority in your life. Do you want to be strong spiritually? You've got to feed on God's word. I don't know for sure what it is that each of you needs to start, but chances are you do if you seek God and see how he stirs inside of you. What story does God want to tell? Do you want to live a story worth telling? Or one day do you want to be embarrassed by another chapter of your life where you're still the author? The decisions that you make today will determine the story that you tell tomorrow. There are times if you're paying attention to where God will stir in your life and he will focus you in on something that he wants you to be doing, but you have to do your part. You have to take initiative to get things going. Now, as the band's coming up here, let me, I want to tell you one final story. I want, to, I want you to see how this principle is at work in this very short story found in 1 Kings 20. Because in this story, this enemy army is planning on destroying King Ahab and the Israelites. This enemy, has thir- this enemy king has gathered together 32 other kings and their armies. And they're planning on coming and basically wiping out King Ahab and the rest of the Israelites. And this is what it says starting in verse 13. A prophet, and that's someone who speaks on God's behalf to the people, a prophet came to Ahab, king of Israel, and he announced, this is what the Lord says. Do you see this vast army? I am going to give it into your hands today, and then you will know that I am the Lord. He said, but who will do this, said Ahab, and the prophet replied, this is what the Lord says. The junior officers under the provincial commanders will do it. Now listen to this last part. And who will start the battle, he asked. And the prophet answered what? You will. You will. So I want to ask you the question, who is going to start this battle in your life? Who is going to start the habit or the discipline that will help you tell the story that God wants you to tell? You will. Because we know from the truth of God's word, that we have a spiritual enemy out there. And this spiritual enemy is looking to destroy us by any means possible. And you are just like King Ahab, where you are in a battle. And some days it feels overwhelming, and you feel like you are so greatly outnumbered. And you need to be reminded that you serve a big, big God. But that God is not always going to just sit back and do everything for you. He expects you to do your part too. And you need to step up and engage in the battle. We don't sit back as Christians. We're not weak and timid and just hope 
that the enemy doesn't get too much going in our lives. We go on the offensive, and we attack those things that the enemy has stolen away from our lives. We take them back under the blood of Jesus Christ. The enemy, for far too long, has been speaking lies into your life, and you have been believing them. And there are areas in your life today where the enemy has had victory, and you need to do battle. And when he says, who's going to start the battle, that battle can start today, and you're the one who needs to get it started. You're the one that needs to make a decision no more. This is an area of my life that has not been fully surrendered to God and not fully going after God in this area. No more. Today, I am going to start something new. I'm going to surrender this fully to God, and I'm handing over the pen because the next chapter in this area of my life, God is going to be the author of. I'm not writing it anymore. Seek God. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and he will help you author the right story. Daniel prayed three times a day, just as he had done before. It was a decision he made, and he kept after it, day after day, month after month, year after year. Why did God look favorably on him? Why was he a man of integrity? Because at some point in his life, Daniel made what others would think maybe at the time was a pretty small decision. He decided to start something. Because he didn't want the same story that he was telling people when he was younger to be the same story that he was telling people when he got older. So he started something different. He started a new chapter. He surrendered it to God. God became the author of it and did incredible things through him. And because of that decision, he was able to tell the story that God wanted him to tell. You can live a story worth telling if you will decide to start what God wants you to start today. I want you to be thinking about those questions. What does God want you to want? As a result of that, what do you need to start? And be reminded, as the band leads us in this worship song, our God is a big, big God. And with him, nothing is impossible. Let's stand up on our feet. Let's worship together, and then we'll close in prayer. Isn't it good to be reminded, and don't we need to be reminded sometimes of just how big our God is, that he is so big that through him nothing is impossible. I want you to think back to that image I put up on the screen at the beginning of our time together, that blank book. The reality is none of us are here today with a blank book, are we? We all have chapters written already, some of us a lot more chapters than others, depending on where we're at in life, right? And again, we can't go back and do anything about those. But what we can do with God's strength is we can turn the page. We can hand over the pen. We can let a new chapter start with an author who's way, way better than you and me. And I think there's some people who need to hear that today. It doesn't matter how many chapters are in your past that maybe something has been broken. Maybe you have been broken or you have done something to hurt somebody else. Unfair things have happened to you in your life. And you need to know that doesn't have to be the story you tell with your future. Your story that God wants to speak through you may be taking those very things and God using them to share those with others to draw other people to the love of Christ. God wants to write a new chapter in your life but you're the one who ultimately has to make the decision of who gets to put pen to paper. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the reminder that that closing worship song was for us this morning. We do believe that you are a big, big God, and we do believe that all things are possible through you. God, my heart's heavy this morning.
because I know there are so many in this room who have chapters written in the books of their lives that are so difficult, that are so heartbreaking, that have led them to believe lies about who they are and whose they are. So God, I pray this morning that your loving arms would just wrap around those who are in that exact place, that you would remind them of just how in love you are with them, that there is nothing they have done, there is nothing they are doing, and there's nothing that they will do in the future that will put them in a place that they are too far from your love and your grace. God, I pray that you would remind us all today that we have choices to make every single day. It's the choices that we make and how we interact with each other, whether that's face-to-face, whether that's social media, whether it's on the phone, how we treat each other in the workplace, how we interact with our neighbors and people that we see out in the local businesses. All of those choices add up to the kind of story that we tell with our lives. And God... We want our heart's desire to be for our lives to tell a story that draws people to you, that lets people know that they matter and that you want to enter into a love-altering, eternity-altering relationship with them. God, we have to make that choice and we have to make it every single day because the choices we make today determine the story that we tell tomorrow. Be with us as we continue to study this important topic. Help us this week to marinate on those questions about what it is that you want us to want and what do we need to start doing about it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, one last instruction for you before you take off. We have an old school typewriter over here with some paper next to it. And we would love, as this series goes on, if you'd go over there, just type whatever word we're doing that week or we've done in previous weeks, type that one word, and then write, like, type th- three or four sentences about how that is affecting you. Like today, maybe God put something on your heart this morning for you to start. Just go over there, type start, three or four sentences about what you are deciding to start today, what you're making a commitment to change today to go in a new direction after God. Maybe you come in Wednesday night, for those of you who come to WOW, and you got something on your mind by then, go over there and type that up, upcoming weeks. We're just going to have that throughout the whole series, and then we're going to do something with that afterwards. So be a part of that. Our prayer team will be over here in the corner if you'd like to be prayed up for anything that's going on in your life. We'd love to be able to pray over you. Otherwise, have a great week, and we'll see a bunch of you on Wednesday.